G'day everybody, and for those who have come in late, you're listening to X-Band, the Phantom Podcast. 500 years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom! The ghost who walks the phantom Enemies beware The phantom's always there But you won't find the phantom He finds you We are the x the Phantom Podcast from Chronicle Chamber. Our website is chroniclechamber.com and you can contact us via email, which is chroniclechamber at gmail. This is episode 161, July 2020 Comics and News. My name is Jermaine. And today I am joined by Dan. How are you, mate? Good, uh, good, Jermaine. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> good. Myself there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm um, going good. Um, we won't. We don't have Stephen with us at the moment. He's um, with COVID hitting Melbourne and Victoria quite hard. Um, it's a little bit crazy there with his schools, and there's been lots of schools that have closed down in a lot of areas. So, mm. um, unfortunately, it's still real for a lot of people and um uh you know you and i we're quite lucky we've got football we've got crowds of football we've got local competition and stuff like that but um, i think we're actually the exception to the rule world yes. um queensland yeah. australia like yeah um uh, when we say it's still real it's uh it's easy i guess in our areas to become a little bit complacent because um uh, you know we are starting to well we're at the moment we're lucky enough that we can do um normal things but uh, the reality is for the vast majority of the world, really, yes. um, you know, everyone's keeping their heads down and rightly so. Yeah. So a huge shout out to everyone who, um, you know, who, who's, in a, who's in a dangerous situation. Stay safe. Um, please, you know, wear masks, uh, practice social distancing. Um, keep it, you know, um, you know, our thoughts are with you. Um, you know, and if you've, make sure you keep in touch with people as well because it can, it's, can be a lonely time as well. So um, we're going to have some fun tonight as you listen to this, and hopefully it will put a smile on your face, um, and it could be a bright light in, unfortunately, what, can be, what is a bit of a dark 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we're going to have some fun. Um, and our thoughts with everyone, a uh, huge shout-out to everyone who's, um, who's in isolation or, or who could be sick or, or whatever. But um, we'll get on to it, uh, and then hopefully, yeah, we'll have some fun. All right, so we're going to start off with uh, India. Now, um, Regal Publishers, well, we've announced it before, how, they've, how they are uh, publishing in English, some comics. They have now released their first uh, one and two, which come out on the 1st of August. Uh, so this will be within a day or two of this being published on the web. Um, so it's now the first two covers, which are interesting, are actually uh, done by an Indian... Um, uh, a local Indian artist who, um, Vincent Raja, who's actually also did a piece in our Chronicle Chamber uh, 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 book as well. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's great to see um, uh, some local Indian talent doing covers. Uh, as those who have listened to the last um, podcast with Luca Roberta, he's doing one of the issues, either three or four for the cover. Um, and so for those who don't quite see the resemblance, Dan's just going to show you a picture of uh, the local artist. Um, so over to you, Dan. Wow, well, a picture of the local yeah. artist. I was just going to pluck yeah, out. The local the, I've got, I'm t- sitting to my left. So that there is, um, is the, I'm trying to get the light right on it now. Can't see the kangaroo. But uh, there's, <laughs> the light's atrocious. Um, anyway, it's. What page? It's on page 23. <laughs> Sorry, Vincent. That there we go. That's it. The the black and white one on the on the screen there. Um, so I that was one of my um, that was probably one of my favourite pictures that came in um, from a an artist I hadn't heard of when yeah. we were when we were bringing the the book together. And um, I was absolutely stoked to to get the news from you that uh, he'd actually then not necessarily on the back of that, but surely um, we'll claim it. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> the, the, the Chronicle Chamber influence um, has uh, helped get him the gig as the as a cover artist for Regal as they go into the English language translations, which is really exciting, uh, not just for him but uh, for all Indian fans. 
and, and even international fans who just love collecting comics from around the world. I imagine, uh, Jermaine, you'll be uh, getting at least a couple of copies of uh, the yes. Regals as they come out. Yeah, I've got, um, it's kind of funny when we broke the news, uh, I had like, oh, would have been probably two or three people contact me straight away. Like, the, I, you know, you're getting myself a copy. And so I'm getting five copies and I think they're already, um, you know, people are already uh, asking for them and they're already gone. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's very exciting. In terms of the, the way you're collecting those, um, it's a friend in India who is going to buy them and, and ship them over for you, I imagine. There's, you can't really subscribe to Regal? Um, you can't subscribe. You can buy them direct from Regal, and they do um, ship internationally. That's how I got the first couple. Mm -hmm. um, and their postage is quite reasonable, and they're, quite, they're very good to deal with. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you don't have a friend in India who, you, who can buy them for you or you can do a swap, um, recommend hitting up regal um as well so you know they're, they're easy to deal with they are they are good so and uh the the link to that website's on our web page i imagine yes of course uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh they're also on facebook as well so um if you just search for regal publishers or again go to our website and social media it'll all be up there as well however we have a bit of a uh, exclusive um regarding um uh, regarding Regal Publishers. Now, it's not set in concrete yet. That's, this is how fresh it is off the news. <laughs> um, but they are looking at doing s free supplements from issue three, four, maybe even five and six onwards. So when we talk about supplements, it's we're talking about whether it's like stickers. Like, for instance, when we got the Kid Phantom magazine, there was posters, there was stickers with them, you know, stuff like that. So Regal's looking at ways of creating the pester power, as we've talked about before. So that's that's really exciting. Um, hopefully Regal will, will announce that soon. Um, and then, yeah, and then from hopefully from issue three and four and onwards, um, that will be something that they... Um, that they'll, they'll be doing it because people will buy it for some licensed stickers or a card or, you know, people will do that. They'll go, oh, it's not just a magazine or a comic. I'll, I'll get that as well. Hmm. So would you be likely to look at one if there was something extra? Oh, uh, look, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'd be slightly more inclined, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I'm not a you've got to draw lines somewhere when you're collecting. And, and for me, it's always been um, the, well, I guess it's for me, I have never really gone after the foreign or the, the non-Australian um, items so much. Um, just that there's so much you can get that's just Australian <laughs> or American, I suppose. Um, and you've got to draw a line somewhere. But the fact that it's in English language helps yep. and, and makes me more inclined because I can actually read the book. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not a massive fan of having stuff in the collection that I can't access or, or yep. read. Um, and I'm far more of a reader than I am. Like, I like artwork, obviously, um, yeah, that, yeah. that comes with the, the comic books, but I'm a reader rather than a, a, an art lover. Um, so, yeah, the fact that it's in English language is probably more persuasive, honestly, than, than uh, a set of stickers or a badge or, any, or anything. But, of course, um, they always look great in the collection as well. So, um, and, and the good thing with Regal, too, even importing them from India... Um, they're pretty reasonably priced, and so um, they might be the sort of thing that you know, if you get in a couple, you might give one away to your kids and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, and they're good stories. They're um, starting off with the Graham Nolan stories uh, in colour. Um, so I think it's a very wise choice starting off with Graham Nolan because he's a big name. His artwork and the stories are good quality. Uh, they hadn't they haven't been published in India previously. So even if you're an Indian, you know, an older Indian fan, you might have read the stories online or got a through comic or something that's in black and white. But the only time, the only other time they've been published in colour um, is once or twice in Sweden, and then also um, the Moonstone did their double issues. So mm. for a, for a, probably the majority of Indian readers, it's going to be the first time they've ever seen this work. And Graham Nolan is a name which will attract interest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so no, I think you're right. I think it is a, a good place to start, and um, yeah, I look forward to look forward to seeing um, seeing them on the on the not so much the shelves because they haven't been on the shelves over here, but I look forward to seeing pictures of them on social media in the wild and that sort of thing. Yeah, and 
and then as they come to Australia. So, um, yeah, that'll be good. Awesome. All right, so we've got some other news uh, about some uh, Australian items uh, that's just been released. And this one's a huge shout-out to Sean uh, Bassett, who uh, spotted this one. He's a, a loyal Patreon supporter. Um, so for, uh, Icon Collectibles have, I guess, opened up for pre-order or pre-release uh, a heat-changing mug and also a new puzzle as well. So this is quite exciting. It's uh, lower-end price price items um and then dan's just sh uh, sharing them on there so this is uh, this is the heat changing mug um, yeah, so if you're looking on youtube you can see that but just to describe it i, I like the fact that it's a new image that we haven't yes. seen before we've got the you know it's a cup of coffee that you're buying or a mug and the phantom sitting on the skull throne with with his uh steaming hot cup of um of coffee or, or piping hot milk whatever he's drinking there and uh, the heat change aspect of it, and um, a lot of people would remember the other heat changing mug that Icon came out with a few years ago, which uh, Jermaine's probably just reached. I can see mine, but it's on the other side of the room. Jermaine, yeah, got... I'm, I don't know where mine is. I got two of them or three of them, but yeah, they're somewhere. <laughs> but uh, this one looks really cool. Like when the when the hot liquid goes in, it's going to change, and you can actually see some um, some comic strip on the side there. So. Um, they do a good job of them, and uh, like you said, lower end of the market, uh, a, a price range, $15 or $18 or something like that. Yeah, uh, 15 on the website at the moment. Yeah, and um, I talked to my um, LCS, and he's he, he quoted me 18 but he, that's you know not going to cost me the postage. So Yeah. Now, I think these are brilliant. Uh, they're pre-order. So this and the puzzle, which we'll talk about in a second, are available in November, which is perfect time for Christmas. Yep. Um, because let, let's face it, a lot of fan of fans, um, their significant others struggle to find phantom presents for Christmas and, and stuff like that. And here's, here's two, uh, you know, and you, you need probably two mugs anyway, one to keep mint in the box and one to use. So, you know, there's one for both kids or both mother-in-laws to, uh, or, you know, both, uh, mums to to get you as well so um I, I i really like it and as you said the best thing about this is the fact it's a new image because yep. i really get sick and tired of new products coming out and it's just the stock standard well used non-imaginative images so this is a huge tick uh to icon collectibles in my opinion yeah absolutely and i'm just looking now for the way to Suddenly, I seem to have broken Zoom. Um, oh, no, there we are. So you should be able to see now the, the puzzle, um, which has come out, which is it's an interesting choice for them to bring a jigsaw puzzle out. Maybe it's on the back of um, um, isolation and, and ScoMo saying we all needed jigsaw puzzles. Um, and probably a little bit with Fanfare was a little bit popular as well yeah. with the ones that Glenn brought out, the two. Yeah, and I guess that was the, the interesting bit because when um, I think you messaged and said, oh, there's a new puzzle coming out, I was like, oh, Fanfare's released their third one, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I can't. Um, and look, a thousand-piece puzzle, that's going to be pretty challenging with all the different shades of green and purple and brown that are in it, um, so it should be pretty good. Um, I can't, it was 25 or $29 the price on this one, you'll remember, Jeremy. 25 but again, it will probably be a little bit higher if you're buying from a local comic shop and, yeah. and stuff like that as well. Yeah, so, um, no, again, and, and as you say, really good timing um, for these because um, if, as a fan, if you can just not pre-order but send the link to, as you say, your significant others, they can pre-order for you and, um, and suddenly Christmas is taken care of and you're getting something that you, that you really like rather than just jocks and socks oh. as uh, you tend to do. Yeah, now, honestly, jocks and socks and towels are not Christmas presents. <laughs> unless of course they are, uh, unless of course they've got the phantom just wrapped all over them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you but again, it's still not a Christmas present. <laughs> 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 but no, this is really good. Uh, glad, you know, glad to see it. Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully people enjoy it as well, and and then we can see some more progress um, shots over, you know, over the Christmas holidays and stuff of people's puzzles and stuff like that. Yeah. As well. So, um, yeah, no. A huge tick, huge tick to Icon Collectibles um, that we can add some more items to our collection. Did you think it was interesting, and, and that we, the timing's great with Christmas, obviously, but did you think it was interesting that um, it's only a month or two later and they could count it as an 85th anniversary um, celebration type thing? It, it's not, neither of them are branded 85th anniversary. Okay. 
it will be interesting because most licenses now this is most licenses are for five years so from memory they brought it out they first had their license in the 80th year was when they started releasing stuff so maybe they haven't renewed and that's might be reason why they haven't brought it into the sixth year or the 85th year um or maybe it's just going to be the start of more stuff mm. um I, oh, it's just, yeah. we always like seeing new merch come out so yeah. and again an, an affordable merch particularly yeah but and if icon, you, icon's not renowned for their um their affordable merch well they are and they're not like they they've definitely got their high-end merch like mm. for instance the you know devil here at phantom and devil phantom and hero statues but then they did release the bobblehead which was about 40 bucks mm-hmm. they've released the heat changing mug which was 15 20 yep. uh the little pop vinyls which we, uh, all yeah. th- we all think they're ugly but they were very popular and there was four <laughs> colors of those at, at 15 20 bucks each as well so um yeah i i i think the heat changing mug and a puzzle is a good idea um the puzzle's very well priced I can't mm. remember at the top of my head what the fanfare one was. Um, thirty, I think. Yeah, I think it was around thirty to forty. Yeah. So, it's a oh look, I just went and um, um, bought a Harry Potter puzzle uh, only a fortnight ago for for my son for Gus's birthday, and uh, it was thirty five, I think. So, yeah. um, it, in looking at the shelves in Toy World where I was, um, twenty five is really well priced. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, so very good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very impressed with that. Anything else you want to add to that? Otherwise, we'll move on. No, just looking forward to seeing them. It'll be good. Yeah, exactly. And then hopefully there will be some stuff next year for the 85th mm. as well. We'll know exactly which, uh, which ones are mine by the shapes under the Christmas tree this year. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so the next bit of news we're going to be talking about is something that just recently broke at the San Diego Comic Con at home so normally san diego comic cons the big one so there's the new york one there's the new york toy fair and then there's the san diego comic con they're like the big ones and all big announcements usually get made at one of those three um so there's a, a publisher which i can't remember what their name is um but they've just picked up the license from king features for mandrake but they're doing a rather interesting take on this now I know people were saying, hang on, this is a phantom podcast. The, the two reasons why we're doing this. One, for completeness, completeness sake, in the sense that it's loosely related to the phantom, and so we thought we will touch upon it. And the second, which I will get onto in the later discussion, but I'm hoping it could be a bit of a backdoor with a phantom twist. So that's why we're talking about it. Um, now, on our social medias and then also it will be uploaded to our phantom preservation project there is an interview with the writer as well as the king features representative and this is probably the first time most of us have actually seen something from king features so that gets a bit of a tick they have a bit of an interview talking about this new series now it's not mandrake so to speak it is actually a mysterious girl called mandy and she has powers like mandrake and uh her best friend is lj who is lothar jr who is the son of lothar and everyone will know who lothar is um so yeah so there's been a bit of discussion over the weekend as we've been as we recorded this and it's been a bit mixed um now We'll be honest, neither of us are Mandrake fans as much as we are Phantom fans. Um, but do you have anything you want to um, talk about that one, Dan? Very little, to be honest, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you said, I, I don't know that I've ever actually read a full Mandrake story, to be completely honest, other than the ones where um, the, the crossover with the Phantoms. Um, like, yes, okay, it's interesting in that Mandrake was the other really fleshed out character that Lee Fork created. Um, yes, it's interesting that King Features is moving on um, creating, you know, doing something with another one of their licensed properties. Shows that maybe they, they you know, 
But I don't know that it's going to mean much for the Phantom because, um, and I know you've got your theory, but I, I don't know that it's going to mean much for the Phantom because the Phantom is already still in, in, in high syndications numbers, still in um, new stories, still getting merch like we've just said, whereas Mandrake has fallen off a cliff as far as all of that stuff's concerned. Um, it's, it is about Mandy, but the back image, the, the, there's a shadow image of Mandrake himself on the cover of the, of the book one that they're t- talking about releasing. So clearly he's still going to be part of it. But uh, no, look, to be completely honest, I've got... Now, when you just said there that there's a, um, a representative from King Features actually in the interview, I feel like maybe I could, might watch that just to see what they've got to say and where they're coming from. But other than that, I've got very little interest in this, to be honest. Yeah. And to be honest, I don't think many Phantom fans will have much of an interest. Um, my, I, have, I have a negative and then I have a, a, a positive, which is a bit of a long straw. So my negative is that I'm a little bit over King Features allowing creators to butcher their IPs. They've done it. Uh, they allowed Dynamite to absolutely butcher Flash Gordon, The Phantom, and also Mandrake. Uh, the last Phantom, I enjoyed personally, but a lot of people didn't. Uh, King's Watch, majority of people did enjoy it, which was the first series which saw basically a modern version of Defenders of the Earth. But pretty much everything after that, King Features absolutely butchered. Um, and it wasn't to do with the, with the creators that were working on it. The creators were actually very talented. Um, and in talking to a few of the creators, they've all expressed disappointment with DE as well, or Dynamite as well. So King Features need to be better at who they give their license to and make sure they actually do a proper job. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because with the Phantom, all we hear about is how tight they control the um, the IP and every story has got to be approved. Every cover has got to be approved. We, we, things like um, the Antonio Lemos cover where the spear had to be removed because that wouldn't suit the fan. That's not how they wanted the Phantom to be portrayed. So they can be really, really tight in the way that they're policing the Phantom from everything that we understand. And uh, and yet here with uh, with other characters, they 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 let them have a have a lot of um, license. Well. Yeah, you, you're completely right. If Fru try to create something like The Last Phantom or even, uh, you know, what they did with King and stuff like that, um, KFS would not allow them to do it. So it, I don't know whether it's just because Dynamite basically paid, you know, a huge contract and they had total freedom. Yeah, um, it's interesting now, now that you mention it, that Phantom by Gaslight probably was a little bit in that direction by the time they had three phantoms kicking around. Um, and obviously we know that that wasn't the most successful endeavor that, uh, that Fru have embarked on. Um, but again, I guess that's an example. It, it's weird, isn't it? When they, they're so tight on particular images, but then they let storylines go off on tangents yeah. and characters be created. So yeah. And yeah. Because it's whoever's receives the email on the day. Well, yeah, and I, I, I don't know. I just, I just get a little bit frustrated when, okay, I understand Man. You know, I'm not a huge Mandrake fan, but I've read the comics. I understand the character. Um, I understand that some may say, well, he's a dead character in the sense that there's nothing new coming out, so they do need to recreate something. Mm. And I, I, I understand that to a certain degree. But, you know, in, in talking to, in, in, you know, in listening to the interview, it is quite obvious that the writer did not have much, does not have much of a clue when it comes to who Mandrake is. You know, she said, "Oh, I never heard of it. I thought Mandrake was uh, Tom Mandrake, the writer, the artist." And she, you know, got a bit of a chuckle out of that. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, there's that. And then the KFS lady and stuff like that. They did not fill me with any confidence. It, it just seems like KFS are very fallen asleep at the wheel. Here's an example. I was talking to someone today whose job is actually to design shoes for licensed project, licensed company. So he has designed shoes for My Little Pony, Transformers, uh, G.I. Joe, Hasbro, and stuff like that. So these are a lot better company, a lot higher companies than KFS. And he was telling me that uh, that just recently Hasbro sent them a huge presentation 
to try and flog off their IP to them and say, hey, look, this is what you could do. Do you want to create some shoes using these characters? Does King Features do something like that? Does King Features go around to all the different companies and say, hey, here's the Phantom. This is the first superhero. He's 85 years old. He's been published in 45 different uh, countries throughout our 85 year. You know, do they go out and actually physically sell the, the license? That is a question that I have because I don't think they do. I think they sit there and then they wait for people to come to them and then they just make people's life miserable. <laughs> It, it does come across like that. Um, look, I suppose to, with regard to Mandy and, and this Mandrake, um, it, it's disappointing to hear that there, there's not that awareness of the character um, or the original um, storylines, I suppose, because you'd like to think that some of that history might come through in the new comic. But that said, um, if they're treating this as basically an entirely new creation for a new audience, it doesn't sound to me like they're, they're really targeting the old diehard Mandrake fans. Yeah. Um, so they're almost starting from scratch just with a, um, you know, with something to lean on, if you like. Um, in which case, you know, good luck to them and I hope it's successful. But, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I see a number of people who are really enthusiastic. As you say, the, the conversations online have been pretty mixed. And I do see a number of people who have been really enthusiastic and saying, right, I'm definitely going to get my... Uh, comic store to hold on to those and I'll get the first few and see how they go, that sort of thing. And, and good luck to them. I hope they find their audience and it goes really well, uh, but not so well that they think that that's the sort of thing that they've got to do with their favourite character. <laughs> it's, it reminds me, there's a, um, something that DC recently done is they brought out a series which has gone into comics. It started off a TV show and there's comics, uh, merch and stuff, and it's called DC Superhero Girls. But basically, you have all the superhero girls. So you have Supergirl, Batgirl, Wonder Woman, Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, yeah. all of these characters, and they're teenagers. So yeah. they're going through teenage problems. They're fighting salt, fighting crime and, and stuff like that. And it's very popular. My daughters absolutely love it. They've got comic books. They've got, you know, coloring in books and stuff like that. So this publisher is definitely aiming for that. And I give them, I give them kudos for that. But I just think that, you know, and I understand that they, that you can't just reach the older market. We've had this conversation when it comes to Kid Phantom, you know. Mm. So you know, I understand that. But you know, with Kid Phantom, there's still something there for the rusted old fart Phantom fan. You know, there is something there that oh, they you, can go. Oh, you. you know, oh, this is still my Phantom. I wonder if people will have, oh, this is still my Mandrake if they pick up this comic. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that from what I've seen so far, which, to be yeah, fair, yeah. hasn't been much because I'm yeah. it's again, <laughs> not in, I haven't really engaged with it. So. Yeah, and I'm going, to, I'm going to pick up the first couple of you know, comics and, and give it a go. Now, if I was to be positive, because w- I'm not sure what the what the license deal is with Herms, whether they've still got the license to produce new comics, but it will be interesting whether this publisher is going to do something. Like I said, DC superhero girls, they've now got a Mandrake. They've got Luther Jr. Are they going to bring in, bring in a back door and, and introduce a, a flash Gordon, whether it's a female flash Gordon or even a female phantom or, or, uh, you know, have a mix, you know, mixed gender and have a, a team up series and try and create their own, um, you know, team up. Well, series. in that sense, in that sense, the Phantom um, universe lends itself to to that idea because of the twins. You could have both Kit and um, Heloise come in and be uh, teenage friends of this Mandy character. So, look, there's there's a possibility there, and uh, certainly then. If that happens, I'll be more interested in, and, and go out and seek out some of the stories. But uh, we'll watch your space for mine. Yeah, and let's be honest, that's, that's me being positive. That's me trying to be positive um, and not just, you know, being a negative nearly over everything. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and as I say, I'm not, I'm not negative about it. I'm just not interested. And, and yeah. you know, good luck to them. I hope it goes well. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's not for me. 
All righty. So um, before we talked about um, the interview being on our Phantom Preservation Project, so um, there will be another P3 update in the next couple of weeks probably, uh, and you'll be able to see that on our website. Um, and basically Phantom Preservation Project is part of our Patreon um uh part of our patreon i guess membership i guess you'll call it so patreon is where people can subscribe to us and donate one dollar five dollars two dollars four dollars whatever you feel like uh basically to help us pay the bills which includes the podcast the website um you know and things like that so a huge shout out to all our patreons we you know you know we really appreciate you guys what you do uh, we've had a couple of new Patreons since our last Comics and News, so a huge shout out to Simon Lech and uh, Jeffrey Frendika, who was actually the person who won the Keith Williams um, uh, piece in our last um, Faffle as well. So a huge shout out to those two. Thank you for giving us your um, uh, supporting us. Now, one of the things with Jeffrey too was that uh, Australia Post emailed me today to say that his prize had finally arrived in America. So oh. um, that's probably only a month or six weeks since I posted it. Thank you, COVID. And yeah. uh, hopefully, mate, you'll you'll see that arrive in your mailbox sometime in the next, I don't know, four months. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, on our Patreon, one of the levels we have is if you support us with five dollars or more you get access to our Phantom Preservation Project, which is basically a depository of digitised Phantom content from around the world um, and where basically you get access to it. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully that appeals to some. Uh, you can go onto our website if you want to learn more about either how to get access to that or how to... Um, uh basically um become a patreon and if you are on youtube you'll be able to see dan just scrolling through our index which will give you a bit of an idea of some of the content that we have up there at the moment yeah it's um as you say it is due in another couple of weeks to um add more stuff to this um i lost i've lost count now of how many gigabytes of data this is um just the index goes i think it's over nine pages now um so we are just about due for another one um it's really exciting to see all of the the stuff that we're being able to able to add to that and preserve and, and for people to go through and duncan munro was nice enough to give that a, a good rap last time um i think we were, we did a comic some news it was with him and he gave it a good rap then so that was that was really positive but it, we should note also that as we record this it's coming towards the end of july it's only a month until we switch seasons again and another benefit of your patreon membership of course is um, tickets in the seasonal um, raffle prize draw. Um, you don't need to buy any tickets. If you're a member of our Patreon, then you get tickets allocated um, for each dollar per month that you are supporting us. So we really appreciate that. Um, just a, a little asterisk that it is um, in US dollars. Some people have been surprised by that when they went to Patreon. Yep. Just for your awareness. All right, sweet. We will move over to our comic section. Now, our comic sections can always of the podcast can always be a bit of fun. Now, as we review, some people will agree with what we say and some people will disagree. So the best way to do that is you can email us, as we talked about before, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com, or if you prefer to publicly disagree with us, which is perfectly fine, you can do that via our social media. So you can do that via Facebook if you're searching chroniclechamber.com. Uh, we're also part of the Phantom Collector group which is on Facebook as well. Twitter, if you prefer Twitter, you can contact us at chronicle underscore tweet. Instagram is at chronicle chamber. And of course, uh, YouTube uh, is chronicle chamber. Now this podcast will be on YouTube as we go through the comics and we'll show panels. So you can have a go at us in the well. comments down below. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the newspaper stories because in the last couple of weeks, two, both in the Sunday and the Daily has finished. Uh, and then we're going to go shoot off to around the world with Mikel and then we'll go from there. So start off with we have the spy ship, which had a bit of an Australian influence, um, which is quite exciting. 
which concluded two weeks ago at the time of uh, recording. Uh, Dan, do you want to start off with that one, mate? Yeah, so this is obviously the Sunday story and um, it's always nice with the Sunday, you almost, I I like the Sundays, the fact that you're getting these nine panels and you get a good chunk of story and you get to just sit on that for a week and you almost come back to it and go, oh, that's right, that's where we're at with that because a week's a long time um, in 2020 as we know. So, um, so I look, I really enjoyed the story. As you said, it had a bit of an Australian twist. We had hoped, I think, by some of the the teasers that Jeff Weigel had put out that um, perhaps it was going to be either set in Australia or have uh, an Australian character. But it turned out that uh, George Bass, who um, it was a, a, a seafarer, uh, an explorer, um, at around the time that Australia was being discovered by Europe, um, and he at the Bass Strait, which is between Melbourne, uh, between Victoria and Tasmania, um, and saving the Tasmanians at the moment um, is uh, is named after him. So it was a, it was a, a, a throwback to a, um, a a past fandom who was on the ocean, which is where we know the the fandoms love to be. When they're not in the jungle, they love to be on the ocean. Um, and I can't remember was it the fifteenth, sixteenth fandom now I forget exactly which one it was um, was getting around with George Bass and uh, have to have to mention of course as well he'll shoot me if I don't I uh, have to mention that Jamie Diaz a uh, super fan from um, New York um, did make a cameo well more than a cameo as it turned out he turned out to be um, just about the, the the villain of the piece and uh, one of the few people in uh, in comic in fandom comic history to be killed by the fandom as it's turned out <laughs> um, uh, I'm looking at Wiki and that story had like five phantoms mentioned so might take a bit of time to go through that and uh, that's not very good podcast a lot of empty air <laughs> this, is the, this is the thing with the newspaper strips and, and I'm sure people will forgive us we don't have copies of, of the news strip story in front of us to, to refer to it's, it's really just based on memory so um, mm. I guess it's as much as anything what impact the story had on us as it went through um, Sundays you, you tend to be able to see um, most uh, most of the strips, but then the dailies it's it's not hard to miss a day or two and be and, and um, just try and catch up on the continuity. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, this Sunday story. Um, I think that the artwork from from Jeff Weigel was masterful. I'm really looking forward to being able to spend some time over that in a comic book and seeing it in um, uh, you know laid out that way. Uh, what what did you what are your recollections of the story, Jim? Yeah, absolutely love the artwork. Uh, really enjoyed the story. I liked how, and this is the beauty about the Phantom, and we've said this previously, is that you can have a what would you call it a, a period of history, and you can have the Phantom place pretty much anywhere inside it. Um, and if you Team Phantom Man, you can even go back a thousand years. Um, <laughs> um, so I really enjoy this. I like how there's, because even today there's a mystery of what happened to the captain. And so I like, so it's not like Tony DePaul recreated history. He, you know, there's this mystery about what happened to him. And the Phantoms solved, we now know what happened to George, Be- uh, George Best. So it, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was fun. Um, you know, so yeah, the artwork was good. The storytelling was good. Um, Tony D. Paul's probably in his, dare I say it, probably in his prime when it comes to writing. Um, he's doing really good work at the moment, isn't he? And, and I liked the way that he still managed to tie in the continuity of um, Cardia Sahara and all yeah. that. Because, um, th- this was, you know, a throwback to the old, um, Phantom going into the Chronicle Chamber to read a story. In this case, it was to Heloise while she's there, um, recovering from the uh, the reckoning with the Nomad story with Cardia. And um, Cardia was off, I forget now. Um, she was with Diana in the village of the Banda. Yeah, in the Banda, and they were um, sewing things or making, doing craft work, I, I seem to remember, um, and doing, just enjoying life. Yeah. There so, I doing girl things. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eloise is showing you what other girl things could be. <laughs> yeah, should be, mate. I think George Bass, uh, the whole story started from um, him being laid in the vault of missing men. So, yeah. Um, yeah really- the, vault of the, the vault of missing men is one of my most, was one of my 
not the most, but it's one of my favourite kind of areas. And it, you know, yeah. Lee Falk touched upon it once. Uh, Team Phantom Men have touched upon it maybe five times. And well, to be fair, Lee Falk calls... invented it and introduced it, so um, it, it, it was still his idea. Everything else is fruit of the tree. Um, yeah, I didn't say anything like that, but I'm just saying he did it once. <laughs> Team Phantom Men's done it four or five times, and now Tony D. Paul's done it twice because mm. he did it with the Rat, and now he's done it with George Best. So I, I really like it. I'm glad that we've seen more of it. Um, and yeah, and uh, and we're going to obviously talk about the uh, the sun the next Sunday story when it finishes. But geez, I've enjoyed the the first two two Sundays we've seen. Really intriguing start. Really. Uh, um, ripping artwork from Jeff Weigel again. Um, yeah, Jeff so is Jeff is in a sweet spot at the moment with his art. Um, I I think it's slightly different in the sense that probably the best way to describe it is that with his face, there's with his faces, there's more features to the Phantom's face than say a, a Cy Barry or even a Paul Ryan, and probably even Graham Nolan as well where they had the less is more mm. style to the Phantom's face, where Jeff, you know, uses the creases and the lines in people's faces a lot more than what he probably done than some of his contemporaries previously. And I like it. It's got a real sense of realism to it. Mm. Um, mm. So he's in a real sweet spot at the moment. Um, uh, the, you know, the stories are exciting. The stories are interesting. Uh, there's just a, a twig of uh, excitement or a twig of mystery each Sunday. or And mm. so it's good. Um, yep. However, I can't... I must admit, I didn't enjoy the Daily Story, uh, which is probably I'm, where I'm we're going to go really next. To hear what you thought of the Daily Story. Because speaking of creases and wrinkles in a phantom, um, there was a, <laughs> there's a couple of stunning panels in this story. Um, yeah, the art, the art was... Absolutely amazing, Mike Manley. So, what was the? It was the Longo Forest. Was the name? Yeah, of Yeah, the, the Longo yeah. Forest. Um, it's a weird one. And uh, Tony Dupont. I thought you'd like it, to be honest. No, Tony Dupont does like his mis- mystic style stories, and oh. um, he he does. Like, if you've looked at some of the ones he's done for Team Phantom Man, and then he's also done them here uh, for the newspaper as well. You know, there's the um, the Locust Witch Doctors. Mm. Uh, you know, so there is... So he does have precedence for that. Mm. Mm. I really enjoyed the artwork. I enjoyed the human side of the story when the Phantom's talking to the ghost of his father, I guess you would call it. Yeah, so and just his... to just to recap the plot for, for those who came in late... Um, and, and correct me if I've uh, missed some of the parts of the continuity here, but basically the Phantom is tracking down a, uh, a wounded lion, um, chases it into a part of the forest that he probably hasn't been before, um, part of the Lolongo forest, uh, manages to kill the lion, satisfied, eats the heart of the lion, which was interesting, um, and then goes to sleep, wakes up, the lion's gone, it's back alive, there's all sorts of um, uh, visions and that sort of thing that come to him, including, as you've just said, um, a, a past phantom, a father, an ancestor, comes back to visit him. He's quite cranky at him um, for sending, on, on tenuous grounds, I would have thought, um, that he sent Kit to the Himalayas for his education and that Heloise um, had to deal with the nomad. That seemed to be why the past phantom was uh, was upset at him. And then... And this is the thought, the bit that I thought you'd like. Um, told the 21st Phantom, our Phantom, that he therefore did not deserve to lay in the Skull Cave and that when he yeah. died, he, his bones I were like ripped. that bit. Yeah. That I, whole I, part of it was like, ooh, this has perked my interest. Because yeah, I thought it might. Tony DePaul has said on public record, I believe it was on our podcast, yeah. don't ask me what episode number, uh, that if he ever was to write the story about how the 21st Phantom dies, he would not be buried in the Skull Cave. He did say that. He did say that to us. Yeah, he did say sure. that, and he's confirmed that by this uh, by this article as well. So I mm-hmm. like that because it was like, ooh, you know, it was kind of like, you know, a bit of a spanner in the works, a bit of a like, well, hang on, that's, you know, makes you stand up and pay attention mm-hmm. and kind of go, what's going on here? So I mm-hmm. like that part. The... The mystic side of things, 
I'm well, not, the visions, fan, the visions but, yeah. turn out. Garan explains the visions because there's uh, the fleas in the Lolongo forest, which is why everybody avoids it. And uh, it, getting bitten by those fleas make you uh, have that sort of uh, those visions and that hysteria. Uh, so that's how it's explained. Um, I just thought you, I thought you'd really like the element of that. Um, the Phantom, twenty first Phantom, goes missing and is never seen again, and the potential for the tie in with what Team Phantomman is doing at the moment. Yeah, I like that. Um, and Tony DePaul has a huge respect for Team Phantom Men and he has introduced a lot of Team Phantom Men elements into the newspaper stories. Mm. You can find out about those on our website. And since we've published that article, I've actually found two more, which mm. I'll be uh, publishing soon as well. Um, but so, yeah, but the mystic thing, like another similar storyline that Tony's wrote was the Viking castle mystery. I'm not sure mm-hmm. if you remember that story, but there's a, um, it's when basically the Phantom found out that he came from a Viking ancestry. Um, so basically there was a, a wooden Viking castle that arises out of the, out of the ocean in the Moro village. Uh, and the Phantom has hallucinations and stuff. And it was caused by the dry wood from the, the dust from the dried wood gives people hallucinations if they have a specific gene in their blood. Was that and, a newspaper story? Or uh, a... It was a newspaper story and also a Team Phantom End story. Oh, you're right. Uh, so it, was, it, it reminds me a bit of that. And uh, the question I have is, how big is the Phantom's world in the sense of the jungle and stuff like that. <laughs> it, it, it seems like it's as big as the whole of Africa because there keeps being these places and lost <laughs> tribes and things that the Phantoms have never seen before or 21 Phantoms have never seen before. Oh, I just stumbled upon a new tribe. Oh, well, in the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was a new uh, uh, principality in the Misty Mountains that no one had ever seen before too. So, yeah, it, I, I mean, I don't begrudge um, creators from... Um, uh, creating new spaces and that sort of thing. Otherwise, the jungle is, a, you know, as has been explored in other places, the jungle is a, a setting that can be quite limiting. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't begrudge that. Um, I don't, how, how would you feel if, I, I would feel, I think, unsatisfied if, and, and almost like it's unfair, if the 21st Phantom doesn't end up in the skull cave when he's buried like and now and now the newspaper story and team Phantomman with their 22nd phantom series have both hinted at that um i just i would find that to be a really unsatisfactory life's ending. not fair dan no i understand that, I understand <laughs> that. Uh, you know i just i do i as i say it's the the other 20 phantoms are all there it's it's his destiny to be buried in the skull cave um we may never even see the 21st phantom be buried um, or die because that's um, such a contentious issue, and we've explored that in other, at other times. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't find that to be particularly an ending it, enjoy. it will leave a bit of taste in a lot of fans. But in saying that, it can generate an interesting subplot in the sense that what did happen to the twenty first Phantom. Where is he? And so, you know, it, it's just another subplot that could, can, may be explored. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, he may not be buried. What might happen is he might get cremate, cremated and so then they bring the ashes back or, you know, there's, there's different ways to do it. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's, I think from memory, I've got to rewatch the series, but the 2040, Phantom, I think. So I think that would have been the twenty-third Phantom. Um, I don't think he was buried in the Skull Cave either. Well, the twenty-third Phantoms had no adventures that I'm aware of, so that's perfectly fine. The twenty-first Phantom has well and truly earned his place <laughs> alongside his ancestors with eighty-five years of stories, and uh, the idea that the decision to send Kit to the Himalayas for his education means that he's no longer allowed to be buried in the Skull Cave. That's preposterous. So, uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, it could be an interesting subplot. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, no. All right, I'm going to ask a question. 
Probably. So the Diana's death series and then probably the last couple of years of the stories are of a high, high quality. I would go as far as saying we have not seen as high quality from an art point of view, but also from a story point of view until probably the early 80s. I'll just say it's at that level where it's probably the best since the early 80s. I'll be interested in what other people think. If you think that I'm uh, um, off the wall, hit us up on social media. Um, but I'll be interested in, what, uh, in what, what our listeners think about that. I think, I think there's a strong argument for that, to be honest. And, I, and one, part, of it is, um, part of it is the continuity that is working through over the last four or five years where there's, you know, there is a clear line of stories and there's these little adventures that are chapters but they're all clearly part of an overall story that is moving in a direction and um when the late 70s early 80s was a period of time where the twins were born and they were aging chronologically accurately um so that the story of the continuity is moving there as well so um yeah i i can see where you're going with it and and the 90s I don't think any Phantom fan is going to remember the 90s as their favourite period of artwork, for instance. No. The stories weren't as strong because Lee Fork was was ageing and um, and so were the other people who were working on it. Whereas, um, as you've said, Tony DePaul, Mike Manley, Jeff Weigel all seem to be in a really good uh, sweet spot at the, I, I hesitate to say at the height of their powers, but they're going really, really well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it'll be interesting what some of our listeners have to say about that. All right, so we're going to move on. So surprisingly, there's only been one Team Phantom Man issue, um, which we're now going to hear from uh, Mikkel, and he is going to review that for us. So over to you, buddy, and again, thank you. Hello, once again, Phantom Man Reviews by me, Mikkel. Today it's only one issue, number 16 of 2020. It has this cover by Henrik Salström that I think is fitting for the main story, but it's not one of my favorite of his. And the main story is called Mannen som aldrig sov, The Man Who Never Slept. It was published in Fru 979. It is done by Scott Goodall and Carlos Cruz. It starts off with a huge earthquake that could be the backdrop of... Uh, of the story but is not really used more than a way to introduce a new one-off character Yulan, an old friend of Diana who gets kidnapped by the villain he who never sleeps Phantoms reads up about the bad guy in the Chronicles and uh, and later he and Diana goes to Hong Kong to find her so all in all it's a decent story good art um, yeah, it's not much more to say that. And then there's another black and white uh, folk berry story. Janoras Gudar, the Eastern Dark at Janora. And I mean, it's folk and berry, so it's good, but still, um, I, I rather read it in color and unedited. Uh, Except for that, we have this, the result of the best cover. And the winner is by a big marginal. It's 37% for the winner and 13% to the number two. And we also got this great poster. It's awesome. Uh, and... I actually won uh, a bag. And it says, best cover 2018. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's not the same cover as the, the, the poster, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to win this. I'm happy. Other than that, there is a one-page article written by Andreas Eriksson about uh, Phantomen in the 90s, uh, about all the the big things with the election in Bengala when uh, Loaga is not, no longer the president and then it goes over to 
when the movie comes out and everything that happened with the with the Phantom um, back then. And an extra fun thing is on the back of the comic book, there is a reprint of an old ad that ran in newspapers back in 1991 when the comic moved from black and white to color. So that's fun to have uh, in a comic book, I think. Uh, it's called Bifrost Shuven, the Bifrost Thief. We don't know who wrote it, but it's Kari Leppinen who did the art. Yeah, and that's all from me. Thank you and happy phantoming. All righty Thank you for that, Mikkel. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, always a pleasure and it's um, to hear from you and for your review. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the Fru publication. So we've got two issues, uh, three issues, sorry. Um, so we're now going to flash them up if you can see us on YouTube. So we've got issue 1870, which is the Pirates of the Yellow Snake. Uh, 1871, which is the demon. And then we've got a Kid Phantom issue, which I'm rather excited to talk about, which is going to be issue nine. So we'll talk about that in a second. So first of all, we're going to go up with uh, issue 1870, which is an old story uh, which from Norman Walker and Jamie Valve, who both sadly are not with us anymore. And this story was first published in 1984. So this story's pretty much as old as us, Dan. Um, what did you think about the story? Uh, Pirates of the Yellow Snake. I enjoyed the story. Um, yeah, a good old, um, I guess it's the art of Jamie Valve, who I, um, you know, 1984, um, I was seven or eight at that stage, six, seven, eight, uh, in the, in the early eighties. And, um, as these were the new stories, I suppose, that were appearing in through at the time, uh, the Jamie Valve stories. And so, um, you know, that there's a nostalgia value to it in that sense, but then it's a brand new story, which is really cool. And um, as an overall plot, gee, it was a ripper to go from the opium dens that um, the fan was trying to, to stamp out in Bengali, um, you know, corruption of the, the colonial, um, the British officers and that sort of thing there. Um, and then the capture of the Phantom because he's trying to save his, his wife and kid. Mm. And then the, uh, the fifth, well, the, the, the boy who would go on to become the 15th Phantom, um, you know, ignoring his mother's overprotectiveness and uh, chasing the pirates across the, across the seas to China to rescue his dad in the middle of a typhoon. I mean, um, it, it, when you summarise it all like that in a 20-second spiel, there's a lot going on in, the, in it is. Uh, what is a ripper story. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go as far as saying that so far, this is my best story of 2020. Right. Okay. Um, I enjoyed it that much. Um, right. it's got, it's got everything as you said. Um, I, I do like Jamie Vell's artwork. Um, I've, and one of the ways that I classify, try and classify my stories is how often do I go back and read them? Now, I've read this probably three or four times already. Uh, I re reread it again today, um, you know, and then I read it, you know, when I first got it, and then I read it again the next day and stuff like that as well. I've, you know, reread it a couple of times. I've enjoyed it um, all, you know, every time I've read it, I've picked up on something differently. Um, I just, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed how it's got the Jungle Patrol that's in with it. Um, it's keeping with the, you know, the fact that the 14th was still the known commander of the Jungle Patrol at that stage. It's got a sacrifice with him sacrificing his well-being to rescue his family. Uh, the fact that you've got a 15-year-old boy, is, he doesn't behave like a brat like sometimes we see with uh, Kit and Heloise, but he's like, I'm going to do this. I, you know, any rescued a princess, rescued his dad. Um, you know, he, he behaved well above his, his years and he was a real hero. Um, so I really did enjoy the story. I, there's not really anything I can really fault with this story. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I hadn't thought about, um, you know, where it fits in my, in my favorite stories of 2020. Um, it's certainly, I certainly don't hate it. It's, it's a really good story. It's a really good story. A tiny quibble might be the uh, the fourteenth phantom thinking that he can very quickly jump onto a pirate ship and use an axe to chop the mast down. 
surely there's got to be quicker ways to disable a pirate ship than uh, than stand in the middle of all the pirates and try and hack away at the uh, at the mast with an axe. Uh, but that's a very minor quibble in terms of a plot point. Um, they needed to the needed to be able to capture him, and that's how they did it. And uh, he still got he still got the the mast down. He, he got through the got through it quickly. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's a really good story. I'm so glad that um, the Fru Crew saw fit to publish it for us. Um, it might be 2020 and 36 years later um, after it was originally published, but I'm glad we finally got it. Yeah, yeah. And now the cover generated a bit of uh, interest on social media. Um, I reckon that this cover was actually originally intended for the um, Supernova pirate theme for the Jam cover. Um, yeah, Dudley certainly says in the message from the publisher that it was um, an image that's laying around for a while and they were just using to yeah. look, use it for a pirate-themed story. Yeah. Now, if you're on YouTube or if you're one of those type of people that like to find where Glenn Ford uh, hides his signature, he's actually done it on this cover. Uh, on a couple recently, he hasn't done it. Um, so the bit of rope there underneath the uh, that's running parallel with the Phantom's armpit, uh, you can see his signature in the knots of the of the rope there. So I'm glad to see that Glenn has gone back to that tradition, and I hope he continues because every Glenn Ford cover should have his signature on it, hidden somewhere. Yep, fair enough. The the thing that I actually um, was surprised at with this cover, I suppose, was just the size of the the thirty six pages and the the issue number there. It's actually yeah. quite large compared to most others, and it's placed below the the title yeah. font instead of above, which they usually do. So, um, in that regard, I, I thought that was a bit glaring. Uh, maybe they were trying to fill some space there because, again, I think you might be right. I might be onto something here about it was designed for a jam or so they weren't necessarily looking to – Glenn wasn't necessarily looking to fill this space, but I found that a little bit um, garish, I suppose. <laughs> Doesn't fit with your uh, with your OCD. <laughs> no, correct. Come on, Dudley. They're all supposed to be in the same spot. <laughs> uh, the free logo was different as well. Um, the, that, yeah, like, I noticed that was their fancy one with the yeah, uh, yeah. rather than so if you if you again if you're on YouTube you'll be able to see I'm just gonna um, show the two of them up on my screen so you can see the normal one and the flashy one. I think the flashy one was the one that they used for the Cy Barry cover on the 70th anniversary, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and they've used it also as a sticker on the back of the signature series as well. That's um, right. To be honest, I did notice the the different layout to. It didn't really bother me. Um, <laughs> it might have something to do with the fact that the Phantom's arm is so long and they, you know, maybe overlapping the the, yeah. the Phantom, you know, was going to cause some issues and stuff like that. I don't know. Um, a couple of things that did interest me is I love how Jamie Valve does his bad guys. They're, they're very, it's very McCoy-ish in the sense that you know who a bad person is by how they look. If they look ugly, they're a bad person. Um, uh, well, just the way that we're introduced to the um, the the corrupt commandant of the yeah, yeah. He's, he's this fat lad sitting in a tub, um, smoking his cigar, <laughs> monocle in. Um, you know, it, it, you couldn't get you, you you knew from the moment you saw that panel. Ah, oh, this guy's all over the opium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's nothing. Oh, uh, I, I like it. Um. Another thing that I found interesting was when the Phantom threatened uh, to hang the bad guy on pages six to seven. So yeah. um, I was, I'm surprised that, you know, so there's just there where he says, I'm going to hang you um, on page seven. You can see that. That, the hang. that panel in the top right there is um, yeah. just so well laid out with the, you can see the, through the noose um, mm -hmm. and he knows that his about, head's about to go through there if he doesn't talk. Now, I didn't mind that in the sense that I know some people will be a little bit, oh, it's not, you know, not, not quite, but I didn't mind that. We know the Phantom was not going to do it. Um, he's dealing with people, he's dealing with people that prey on the weak, that destroy people's lives and all that. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, but I think that there might be some people that do. Yeah. Phantom is rough on roughnecks, old jungle yep. saying. And uh, he's also, this is, this is what the 
1500s. So um, times are different and uh, methods are different. And uh, he still had the panel of saying, the jungle patrolman saying, hey, you weren't really going to do that. No, of course I wasn't, but he did know that. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to talk about that or we'll move on to the demon? Very entertaining story. And you're right. It will be one I go back to and read again at some stage. For sure. All right. All right. So the next issue is 1871, which is a rather interesting cover by Jamie uh, Johnson. Um, uh, so there's the front cover. There's the back cover. Um, I, I like aspects of it. I love like the use of the color and I love the whole spot like feel to it and all that. Yeah. If I was to be picky, it didn't really match much to do with the story, but sometimes I think that's good. And sometimes I think that's bad. And I'm kind of on the fence, whether I think it's a good thing on this story or a good thing or a not thing. It's a striking image that stands out. So I, I, I don't know whether, I don't know whether I, I like it. The fact that it doesn't really have much to do with the cover, but, um, you know, I, I like the image that has been portrayed, and I think mm. that is a better choice than the back cover for a front cover. So I thought it was a good package. It didn't even occur to me, to be honest, that it yeah. um, that it wasn't from the story as such. Uh, the back cover montage is all um, taken from inside the story, um, of course, and I, I just like the colours on this. I, lo- yeah. I like the, I like the bright, as you said, the spotlight effect, the yellow. It's an unusual sort of a, a colour for the front of a a Phantom comic. Uh, Jamie, as always, has done a really ripped Phantom. He does, um, you know, Jamie Johnson's Phantom is one that uh, clearly works out a lot and does far more sit-ups than I've ever done in my life, probably rips those out before breakfast. Um, you know, yeah. he's a, he's yeah. a, a cut figure, uh, which is a, you chiseled. know. He's chiseled. He is absolutely chiseled, uh, which, which some people love and some people are not so much fans of. Um, I like the, you know, I, I like a balance where you, there's there's all sorts. So um, I know I really enjoyed it, and I liked the the way that he got the shadows on the face in particular. Yeah. Um, and still has the the glowing eyes. Um, now, did the, you use uh, the word package uh, deliberately? Uh, no, I don't even remember using the word package. So no. <laughs> <laughs> but I know question, that there was certainly- question that I have is uh, I heard that um, Jamie Johnson posed for this. Did he shove a uh, <laughs> a, a, um, a pair of socks down his trunks when he um, when he took a photo to uh, to work on this image or not? See, what you're doing right now is just making sure that Jamie gets in touch with the moment that he goes past. <laughs> G'day, Jamie. Love your work. Um, and uh, yeah. You, you, we've already had a bit of a laugh about it, I'm pretty sure. But, um, yeah, I'll be interested to hear um, whether he did put a pair of socks down there or not. <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> the story. The story. What did you think? So we've got the same creative team from Pirates of the Yellow Snake, um, Norman Worker as the author and Jamie Valve as the artist. Um, what, when was this originally published, Jermaine? Uh, 1989. 89. So a little bit later. Um, now, I would go as far as saying that Norman Walker and Valve is probably the best combo after Fork and Barry, McCoy and Moore. I don't think there's been probably another um, creative team that I can think of, apart from Fork and those guys, who have worked so well together than Norman Walker and Jamie Valve. Um, well, you put on the spot. Question without notice. I've got. You might well be right. Um, they are a good combination, and this and they did it for years and years. Yeah, I'd need to. I'd need to spend some time looking at lists of um, other stories that they'd done. But uh, yeah, look, it's a, I'm, I certainly can't dispute it at this stage for sure. I think David Bishop and Caesar Spadera with their Kate Somerset stories. That was a very good combo. Um, and then we've talked to uh, David Bishop about that. Um, but Jamie Valve and Norman Walker have done it for years and years. Like Norman Walker, he was kind of like the Clace Ramifi before Clace Ramifi. He was the mainstay, the main writer who basically developed. And if you go back and have a look at his stuff, he 
developed a lot of the backstory for the first Phantom, for, you know, past Phantoms and stuff like that. Uh, even Diego Singh, he was the guy who created him. Um, so, you know, it, he was kind of like Clace removed before Clace, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, sure. Clace, uh, and then Jamie Vell was, you know, the, he was the main, he was the main, the main right, the main illustrator. He, you know, for the seventies and eighties as well. Now, this is probably towards one of his last couple of stories. I enjoyed the story. I didn't enjoy it as much as Pirates of the Yellow Snake. If I was to be critical, um, Jamie Vell's artwork, some of the way he's depicted some people is a little bit um, stereotypical, like, for instance, the little um, Japanese boy for uh, Daigo Singh, the little manservant, um, you know. And, you could make that argument, and I thought yeah. about that um, with Pirates of the Yellow Snake too, though, to be honest. Yeah, I didn't think it was as bad as in this one, though. Um, but, yeah, I... I didn't enjoy the story as much as Pirates of the Yellow Snake. I still think it's a good story. Um, uh, it won't get, in my opinion, it won't get the most favourite story of the year. Um, I'm glad we got it. I, I wish, you know, I kind of hope that we continue to get some of these unpublished gems. I just, you know, it was a good story. I enjoyed it. I liked the demon, the bad guy. I thought he was a, a likable villain. You almost feel sorry for him by the end of it. See, uh, I thought that was a weakness of the story, to be honest. Um, the bit where I, you, it turns out he's an ugly, you know, elephant man, and um, as a result, you feel sorry. The, the Phantom even says, I feel sorry for you, you know. But um, but he's the world's most deadly assassin, and I can't, I'm trying to find the number now, but it was 400. There it is. Uh, known number of known victims, 468. So this man has gone through and killed 468 yeah. um, individual people. I don't care what your face looks like. You probably shouldn't do that. And I don't know that the Phantom is going to go around feeling sorry for you after uh, just because you've got a big nose. Yeah, I think it was more like, it was more like, oh, well, I, yeah, I see your point. Um, and I think, I think you're right in a sense that, you know, he was a despicable human being. Um, but you know, you can still feel sorry that's, you know, that, you know, he probably didn't get, he didn't get the luck of the draw and, um, you know, maybe it did play a small part in his decisions. Yeah. But you, yeah, you, sure. you can't, you know, you can't excuse the fact that he was a despicable mass murderer. Mm. Oh, he looked clearly very good at what he did. That's where I think um, another, you know, if we're going to be critical, and that's what we're do here doing, I suppose, um, another uh, part where the story fell down a little bit was in the demise of the demon. Um, it was almost a little bit too easy for someone yeah. who had been such a, you know, a master of his craft um, to... He, he it was died. kind of like an accident. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. And, the, and the Phantom just happened to be around when it happened. So an unfortunate yeah. sequence of events. So I would have, yeah. I thought, he, I thought he deserved a better end than that. Yeah, I would have preferred it. And this is, again, being very critical. I would have been preferred if instead of it ending and finding out that he was ugly and feeling sorry for him and stuff, if they had spent an extra time having a better fight yeah. between the Demon and the Phantom. And then he fell off and it was like, oh, well, here's his mask. I don't know whether he survives or not because then you could bring him back. Yeah. Yep. No, um, I, I agree with that. That would be that would have been better um, because he was actually a really good character probably up until the moment when the mask came off, yeah. to be honest. Like, he was a really compelling character, this, this mysterious assassin called the Demon who's got this, you know... I don't care if you are the leader of the Sing Pirates, you will come to me at a place of my choosing and you all, you know, you, you'll pay me what I desire and all the rest of it and, and I'll get the job done. And uh, so it was a really cool villain. But I guess in, in traditional Phantom style is uh, dealt with and we never see him again in another story. Yeah. Yeah. It was almost like we saw you know, like two versions of the demon. There was the bloodthirsty one and then there was the the almost likable buffoon who we feel sorry for. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. It didn't, yeah, it didn't really fit in a sense. The, the, the first... 80% of the story was really compelling and then I just didn't enjoy the way it finished. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Cool. All right, well, we're going to move on to Kid Phantom 9. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to do things a little bit different because let's face it, Dan, sorry to say this, but you and me, we're old farts. And this is a comic for all ages. So the what we're going to... So. <laughs> Kids kids are, are. Yes. <laughs> so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to get the next generation of fans to tell us a little bit about uh, the review of this. Um, and then and then us old farts will have a go. So we'll let the youngins have a go. And um, now just their heads up, they are super important. The next generation is important. That's why the Kid Phantom was created, uh, to try and get the next generation of fans. So then that way, um, you know, we can be going up to episode 500, 600, and maybe even 1,000 because there'll be people in the next generation still wanting to learn and listen about The Phantom. So over to you, uh, young guys, and uh, thank you for your reviews. All right, Gus, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, Kid Phantom number nine? Um, so firstly, I really like how um, Kid Phantom Grand and even um, Diablo um, have the mask. Um, also, another thing is I really like um, the bird Cheese. <laughs> I'm really glad he came back. Yeah, he flew away for a little while, didn't he? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I like that they like just the name. It sounds a bit quite calming like Clarksville yeah okay um and uh, I like it because <laughs> <laughs> Mikey's just coming to be part of the podcast <laughs> because um I, it's a peaceful town with a peaceful name mm -hmm. which I think is pretty cool um I, I like um like how energetic um Diablo is mm -hmm. that he's so cute. <laughs> um, and um, I like how he's like going in the fountain and he's not supposed to. And the uncle, I'm pretty sure it is, is that saying, um, by Clarksville standards, that's a pretty that's a newsworthy story. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that's pretty funny. And like, like I like how they get to share a room because, um, Gran and Kit, because they're r really nice to each other and it's good to see them, like, together. Mm -hmm. And I like how Diablo just goes onto the couch straight away. Hmm. He owns the place. Yeah. And he also goes into the backyard. Yeah. Um. And like, I like how it says that they make the um, tree house in just one day. And it's a very busy working day, isn't it? Yeah, it's a. I didn't think we would finish it in a day, but everyone worked really hard. And I like how in the background it's got the phantom good, good mark right there. Mm -hmm. it, and I I like that. Um, like like just here, it's. The that trouble is never too far away. Mm -hmm. So because they had only heard before from the aunt that um yeah that there had been train robberies mm -hmm. or truck robberies. Truck. Yeah. Um, and I re I really really like how um like they they're calm and reading, and then. They just run, run, run right through, 
and then the uncle looks exactly the same. Because they woke up. And then the exact, like, everything else is exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly the same. Way different. Mm. I like how he, when he gets knocked out, um, he's got the um, skull mark. Mm -hmm. Not on his face, but around him. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, because Kit hasn't got the rings yet, has he? No, that's right. I'd like to see him ha with the rings. Mm. I, I really like, like the introduction of a, a new bad guy who won't reveal his face. Um, my first thought was maybe that this big guy here, the scientist, was maybe, um, the Lord Rat. Oh, right, eh? Like, maybe he had, like, come back. Like, maybe. Mm. Like, maybe he, like, had this weird thing he could do. He could make masks and, like, stick them on his face and only he could, like, take them off and stuff. Oh, okay. And, like... That isn't a mask, it's like stuck on. Yeah, yeah, okay. I hadn't even thought of that. That's a good thought. It's a good thought. <laughs> and I, I find it pretty funny that Diablo's got a mask on because it won't really matter. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but what was really um, cool is he, like, he was like, I believe this is a conversation for another time, just right there. Mm. And then Millie straight away is like, "Is like, uh, anyway, tomorrow will be a big day for you, Kit. It's it's your first day at your new school." And I was like, I turned the page, thinking there's plenty left in the book. Mm. And then I turn it and it. The Green Guardian. <laughs> right. And you did say to me when you read it the first time how short the story was or how yeah. quick it had gone. Yeah, it, it was nearly as short as the last one. Yeah. But I do like like the um how how the Green Guardian goes on for the last one where okay. Kit gave Marianne um the Phantom suit and she um changed it up a bit. Mm-hmm. And made it green. Sure. Yeah. I like. I like how. Um. Well, I. It's. Yeah. It's just really cool, and I like how concerned Gran is. Like, he's like. Um, where is it? <laughs> um. Oh, relax, I'm not going to run in, run away into the jungle. I tried that once and it didn't work out too well. Mm. I like how that, like, follows on from the um, last story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you enjoyed the Green Guardian story as well? Yeah, definitely. And I like how, um, like, um, it's like, he go like they hear of trouble and then Mar Marianne's already gone yeah right yes and what I also really like which I thought was pretty cool is when the phantom is really good with the guns Marianne is good with shooting arrows yeah okay good pick up and I'll like, look, there's five arrows all at once, mm. and every single one hits its target. Yes. And while they're all being distracted trying to get the guns again, and they don't notice that they're gone, and then <laughs> what I thought was pretty funny... Harry, get your guns before clink. All of you seem to recognise that sound. Oops, oh dear, the cage is open. <laughs> so can, she's let the tiger and, out. Yeah, no, can I make a suggestion? Run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's well written there, isn't it? Yeah, and I like how the tiger's like out for revenge. Yeah. Yeah.
Hmm. So, and that's the, we come to the end pretty quickly with Green looking after Moran. Yeah. So, um, so you enjoyed the Green Guardian? Yeah, and I like how in all the books it's a double page, so yeah. it goes on from like you get the main like cover from there, but it can follow on. Yeah, you can open it up and see the big picture yeah. of the front and back cover. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, um, overall, um, did you have a favourite story? The Kid Phantom story or the Green Guardian? Yeah, probably Kid Phantom. <laughs> <laughs> and looking forward to the next one when he goes yeah. to school? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I also noticed how um, in the Kid Phantom one, he um, throws the smoke thing. But he in this photo, he's also got two extras, oh. so he's obviously a scientist who does like a lot of things, and like maybe they're the guys in the black suits are maybe like his assistants. Yep. yep. Yeah. Be interesting to see if we see him in the next story. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So overall, you're happy with that? Definitely. Cool. Cool. All right, thumbs up from Gus. And uh, <laughs> thanks very much, buddy. And uh, what do we say at the end of these? Happy Phantoming. Happy Phantoming, buddy. Cheers. G'day, Jeremy. Can I say g'day to me? G'day, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so you just read Kid Phantom, did you? Yeah. Cool, by yourself? Yes. That's pretty cool. How old are you? Six. Six. How many stories are in this Kid Phantom issue? Two. Two. All right. And so there was the first story. The first story is about who? Um, the Kid Phantom. Kid Phantom. Do you remember what town they went to in Kid Phantom? Clarksville. Clarksville. Yeah. Did you like that story? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what it was about? Or did you just read the words? I just read the words. Ah. What about the pictures? Do you have a favourite page with the pictures? Um. In that story? Don't worry about the second story at the moment. I wonder what page you'll pick to be the, your favourite. This one? This one. Why do you like this page? Because he's knocking all of the bad guys out. Cool. What are the bad guys doing, do you know? I'm um, stealing things. They have a truck. Oh. They have a truck. That's no good. How did Kid Phantom and Garan know that they were doing it? Because they um built um, a cubby to watch and then... It start getting light and the bad guys appeared over there. Oh, right. Cool. So you did follow the story. Well done. And so they were able to beat the bad guys. Yeah. Did they beat all the bad guys? Um, there was one more um, left. Ooh. The scientist. The scientist. Oh, wow. I think they ended up... They just ended up... Um, And he put fire everywhere. So he was able to escape, was he? Yeah, they just... Ooh, I wonder what would happen in the next issue. Does that make you want to read the next issue to see what happens with the scientist? Yeah. Cool. So did you like that? Yes. Cool. What about the next story? What was this story about, do you remember? Um, The Green Guardian. The Green Guardian. Who's the Green Guardian? Um, The one... Which of these characters is the Green Guardian? Her. Her, the girl. All right, do you remember where she got her Green Guardian suit from? Who gave it to her? Mm. It was Kid. Kid Phantom? Yeah. Right. And what, is, and what does the Green Guardian do? Um, looks in the um, jungle and sees if there's bird guys. Oh, and was there any bad guys? Yes. What were the bad guys doing in the jungle? Um, trapping the tiger. Oh, did she come to the rescue? Yeah. Uh, what's your favourite part in this story? Um, this bit. <laughs> This bit. So why do you like this bit? Um, because the tigers 
um, tearing his pants off. Oh, crazy tiger. Yeah, oh, very good. So, do you like the, the story and the artwork in both those stories? Yes. That's good. If someone asked you, Jeremy, should I buy this book for my kids? What would you say? Um. Would you say, yes, you should buy it or no, don't buy it? You can if you want. You can if you want. Do you think that they'll enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah. Did you enjoy them? Yes. Yeah. Cool bananas. Do you wish there was more of these issues, more of these sort of um, Kid Phantom books? Yeah. Yeah. Righty yeah. So two thumbs up from Jeremy? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's a thumb. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. And we say happy phantoming. Happy, happy phantom. <laughs> very good. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, how good is it hearing from them um, about their views and uh, getting in the mind of a, uh, you know, of of people much younger than us? Um, it, it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it, it helps you remember why, you know, as I said, yes. we're kids at heart and uh, it brings the kid back out in me anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so we're going to go to Kid Phantom 9. Now, it kind of came out of a bit, as a bit of a surprise. Most people were like, ooh, ooh, it's out. And even the creators were a little bit taken back that it actually had finally come out. So between issues 8 and 9 was 370 days. That's a long time between drinks. Um, you know, not even uh, the Adelaide Football Club have had a, you know, they've had a couple of wins in between that as well. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it is a long time. Uh, I think the only thing that will be longer, and this is a shout out to Grange Wallace, who hopefully I hope he's listening, is I think what's longer than this was when Carlton were last in the top, uh, in the last, last in the top eight. So, um, <laughs> so that, you know, it's not, it's not the longest thing we've had um, between drinks. Um, what did you think about this? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was it was really cool, really fast paced. Um, mm. You know, everything from building a treehouse in a day to suddenly let's let's solve the only crime that the town's ever seen, um, and we'll do that on day one of our time in Clarksville. Um, so for 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 Kitten and Garan and Diablo to arrive in in Clarksville and within a day have achieved all of these adventures is really cool. There was enough little um, nods and Easter eggs to us older fans that uh, to keep you interested in studying every page, um, and and they've introduced a villain who wasn't captured at the end, and yeah, uh, I like that. Be something there for him to come back. So you know, I think um, on on all those levels, it's it's really good. Yeah. Probably my only criticism, and. Um, I know that uh, I'm sure Gus will have said this in the video that I'm going to record with him tomorrow for the thing we just um, thank him for. <laughs> um, but uh, he said this as soon as he'd read it was, it's too short. And, and I feel the same. It was so fast paced. It's, it's over before you've, um, you, you've, you've, I had to read it three times to, uh, to feel satisfied that I'd, uh, that I'd read a full story. It, it's just, um, it's, re it's, I really enjoyed it. It's probably, it would be one of my favorite of the Kid Phantoms so far, actually. Um, other than the first, the first couple were really good. Um, and, and I've enjoyed all of the stories, but, um, yeah, I might, whether it's the, the, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder and I was really looking forward to the next issue, but yeah, I really, I really like, I really love this one. I wonder if it was also because it was so fast paced, whether you, the reason why you liked it as well, because it was. Oh. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Because um, it's interesting. Because I think it was this and the last issue, uh, issue eight, which have been shorter stories, and they've been a lot more faster pace. Uh, and this one in particular, it was like there was almost no time wasted. But I felt like you weren't really shortchanged in a sense. Oh no. Um, which is what I liked. It was, um, and you know, most of us were. We're used to 22 pages, 28 pages stories and stuff like that. Where I wonder if kids' minds who are a little bit more prone to wandering, as a teacher you would know this as well, um, whether getting two stories in this actually makes might make more sense in the sense that uh, they can actually finish the story quicker and without less interruptions. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know about that so much. My um, Gus will quite happily sit there and read for two or three hours from a novel. So um, I'd, maybe for other kids, um, not, not so much my personal experience. Um, I just really enjoyed, um, well, I enjoyed the writing because it is so fast paced and, and there's not a word wasted really as you, as the plot unfolds. Um, and, and part of the fast pace is the, 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 the layouts, I guess, that Paul Mason's done. I mean, the first two pages of the story are both full page, yeah. um, full pages. And then, uh, this one, page eight really struck me. Um, I don't remember that layout from any of the other kid fans where we've got this big picture at the top two thirds, but then an inset picture as well. It probably has happened because Paul's um, r- really good at what he does as well. But, um, you know, just that, that sort of an inset picture, there seemed to be a little bit more of that um, type of, um, you know, we've got through the binoculars here. Um, we've got, uh, and then the, the one where the scientist, you know, drops the, drops the beaker as well, or the, the vial there. It's sort of, is, it's coming out through the page. So really dynamic pictures and, and um, constantly mixing up the layout of the pages uh, it contributes to that fast pace as well. Yeah, he almost... I, I haven't talked to Paul about this, so I'm just guessing, but with what you talked about with the panels, it's almost like he had a lot more fun doing this issue than maybe previous issues. Um, because there's a, you know, there's a lot more spontaneous panels, I guess, you know, like for instance, you, you know, you listed off half a dozen different panels. Um, and I, yeah, like, you know, there's a lot of, I don't know, just, I don't know if, if Paul ever listens to this, let me know, Paul, if that's the case. Um, but yeah, it just seems like, um, with the way he's done the panels, he might have had a bit more fun with this than maybe yeah. a couple of and others. Look, he really, he really does know how to draw a fight scene. Um, you know that that split across the diagonal, split across the page on page seventeen, um, and just every movement. Uh, my lighting's shocking tonight. Um, every every movement is dynamic from uh, from Garan and Kit as they beat up on the uh, on the henchmen. I love it. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Oh, so how many um, uh, Easter eggs did you find? Oh, I didn't count them. Um, oh, you didn't? There was heaps. There was there heaps. There was a few. So I'll, uh, go through a, I'll go through a couple. What was your favourite one? Uh, probably, Glenn, uh, probably Glenn Ford and then also the, um, the Flash Gordon one. The crooner was mine. The crooner, yep. So on page... Three, you've got uh, it's not the best pictures, but you've got Glenn Ford in the middle. He's also on page five, which will be an easy one to show. Uh, there's Glenn Ford uh, as the shopkeeper. That's on page three and five. Uh, page seven. So you've got um, uh, you've got Kid Hercules versus Chesty, and then you've also got the Croner. And then Crone is also on, uh, the poster's also on page 19 as well. Um, now, I didn't find any others until uh, page 14, where they've got that top panel there. You've got um, D. Paul and Manly, which is the, the truck. And then you've got Barry, which is uh, Cy Barry, of course, there. Um, and then on page 15... You've got uh, Flash Gordon gets a mentioned. Uh, I like how they've done the newspaper. It's Gordon gets Flash touch ground, touch down. So, you know, it, it was kind of clever how they've done that one. Mm-hmm. Um, where was the other ones? So on page 19 with the posters, which tends to be one of the more ways that... Um, Paul Mason does them. You've got uh, Grando the Great and you've also got uh, the Phantom Ranger. And then another one which uh, you might use in the same panel is Truck 14. And Truck 14 or 14 is um, kind of seems to be like the Phantom's favourite number and that's usually where he stays in cabins, either 7 or 14. So that was a nice little nod as well that I liked. Uh, did you spot any that I missed? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you've um, 
You've covered all the ones that I found. Yeah. Now, the thing that I liked about this is that we're going to get another issue. It promises one more in our next final issue. So it's, it's, it's a shame that it's the final one, but it's, a, it's positive that they're slating uh, a tenth one at least. Hmm. Well, most of us weren't expecting an, an issue nine or an issue ten. Yep. Uh, we were promised issue nine and issue ten um, when the announcement was first done, and they said they were going to release something at the start of the year, which was the insert with the annual. But I guess with it being a year between uh, drinks, no one just thought it was going to happen. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we're getting an issue 10. Now, um, so we'll move over to Encore. <laughs> um, now, this is a story by EJ Holden, which has to be a, um, a pers- well, how do you say it? A personium? Pseudonym. Pseudonym. Um, Wellington Diaz. And then lettering by Frank Schulson, edited by Glenn Ford. So Wellington Diaz is a Brazilian artist. Yes, that's correct. Hmm. He is a different creator to issue eight when we saw the Girl Phantom or the Green Guardian. Uh, it's a different creator. Um, this is by Wellington Diaz. Um, he was in the. He's got a trading card in the recent Phantom Gallery set. Which featuring, actually featuring this girl, I think. Yes, as actually as the Phantom and not as someone else. Um, although EJ Holden, uh, do you have any ideas who that may be? Well, my my supposition is that Holden's and Ford's um, uh, go together in Australia, and uh, that just seems it seems like Glenn Ford to me. Yeah. Now. That's who I think it is. And I wonder if he is also um, Gabriel uh, Henrique, is it Henriquez, who yeah. also did the first issue and also did the graphic novel for, um, what do you call it? Um, oh, the, um, the Sword of the Caliph. Yeah, the Sword of the Caliph. Because mm. that's by the same Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I'm less confident about that, but I... I do feel like this might be, uh, unless um, unless Glenn has got a brother or a son or something we don't who writes comics that we don't know about. Yeah, um, or he could have a cousin, you know, could be a cousin Holden Ford Cole. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I didn't mind this story. Now I understand why they're doing it because they're trying to appeal to a the girl audience. You know, having a girl hero. And we talked about that a little bit before with the Mandy discussion. Um, And a lot of the... One of the things that I have a negative about The Phantom is that some of the secondary characters are not focused on as much as what they should be. And so it's nice learning a little bit more about Guran, uh, his auntie, um, and then also, you know, by, with, um, what's her name? Uh, Muran. So it's, it's nice learning a little bit about some of these other characters. Now, Team Phantom Men have done that recently with um, some of their backup stories, uh, which we haven't seen in Free Comic yet. But it's the same type of thing. They have not the Phantom. They do it in a kid-friendly style. And then they have stories about, you know, um, one of them was Heloise in a nightclub or, mm. um, you know, so there's these secondary characters which you kind of get to learn a little bit more about. So from that angle, I do like it. I don't, I'm not really sold on the whole Green Guardian type of thing when, which we saw in the trading cards where she was, and in also the movie where she was originally depicted as, the Phantom with a purple outfit and stuff. I'm not quite sold on that idea yet, but I understand the reasoning behind it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because, um, no, I agree. It is nice to hear stories from the Phantom universe without the Phantom in it, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, he's referred to a number of times, but um, uh, I would say about this one, Wellington Diaz, gee, he draws a ripped Garan as well. That... that no, Garan's got more muscles than uh, Jamie Johnson's Phantom in, uh, <laughs> in this story. Um, yeah, that was, kid is, yeah, 
yeah. and I like the setting of uh, Green's about to leave with Kit to go to, you know, so it's sort of set just before um, Kid Phantom number one, I suppose, in that sense. Um, I'm, I'm with you. The jury is out on the Green Guardian. I'm not sure of the need to, I, I guess I understand. I'm probably less understanding of why, given that we know that this is about to be the last issue of Kid Phantom. So why are you trying to establish a new character in the second to last issue of the comic? Um, I don't really, I don't really follow the logic on that, but um, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a Green Guardian series about to follow, but uh, it seems unlikely. So yeah. anyway, I'm, yeah. I'm, I reckon these, I reckon she was probably created before the series was cancelled though. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. Anyway, it, it, a nice bit of fun. Um, I will be actually because I haven't at all spoken to Gus about what he thought of that part of the story. So I'll be very interested to see what he to hear what he said about it. Yeah. All righty. Um, it's, uh, but it's not aimed at me either. So yeah, exactly. Now it is worth just a bit of a heads up. Now, if you did subscribe to get your um. Uh, Kid Phantom, just to double check that you are getting your subscription because, like we said, there's a long time between drinks. Um, you got your copy and your son's copy via your subscription in the mail. Yeah, um, absolutely, and did not chase it up at all. That um, yep. that right. So you know, so we can only assume you know using one person as a basis, which isn't very good science, but. <laughs> Um, forgive me, said. <laughs> yeah, forgive me all the scientists and technical people out there. Um, but you know, it does seem like Fru is still um, honouring the subscriptions, which is good, which is brilliant. I know they've done it with mine. I think it might have been caught somewhere in Victoria because it's still on its way. Um, it's probably at the border. No one's allowed into Western Australia, are they? Not even the mail trucks. Uh, they, they, I think what they do is they, I don't know, I don't know what they do, but we do get mail. Sometimes it's a bit hit and miss. Sometimes you get it quickly. Sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah, no, it's, so I guess what I'm trying to say is if you are a subscriber to it and you haven't got it, just send through a nice email because it might have slipped through. But from what we're hearing, they are onto it and it won't be an issue, which is good. All right, mate. Um, have you got anything you want to touch upon? No, it's just um, just a, just a lot of fun to sit down on a Sunday night and uh, and talk Phantom. And um, we said we were going to keep this nice and tight because there was only two or three comics and a little bit of news, and and we haven't. So, um, in typical style, by the time by the time we get Mikel and um, the other contributions, it's probably nudged out towards an hour and a half, two hours again. Uh, so I just hope that everyone's enjoyed it and um, been able to take their mind off things for a little while and, uh, yeah, keep on phantoming. Awesome. No worries. So if you like what we talk about or anything, you can find us. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, uh, which we talked about at the beginning. Uh, email, you're more than happy to email us about whatever, phantom-related, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. If this is your first time you have ever listened to us, um, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or there's other ways of doing it like Spotify or Android apps like Podbean, Player FM, etc., etc. Or if you prefer to watch us, watch us stuff up and clamour through notes like I am currently doing, you can also do that on YouTube as well, which, uh, again, there's a subscribe button down there somewhere um so say that you should click on the bell and um get notifications and all that sort of stuff so if uh that feels like a good idea i guess do it but uh, yeah. <laughs> i don't know what that does <laughs> uh, but no we appreciate everyone who subscribes to us everyone who listens to us uh from myself i hope everyone stays safe uh be smart uh don't be stupid um and uh until next time guys happy phantoming happy phantoming Oh, and just before we go, you thought we were gone. Just a quick heads up, our next podcast is going to be something special as well, so make sure you look out for that one as well. eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The man can't.
the ghost who walks the phantom. Enemies beware, the phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. He finds you.